Uh, my name is Jesse Tutt, and I work for Alberta Health Services, and uh, this is the HS uh, community of uh, practice dedicated to artificial intelligence. Um, so we talk on a variety of different topics, and uh, this presentation is uh, from Casper. Casper basically uh, works for Fraser Health. I'm very pleased to have him. Uh, Fraser Health is a, a health entity in uh, BC that supports 2 million people, um, so pretty, pretty large size. Um, they lead, uh, he, he leads rather, a uh, team of data scientists uh, and data engineers and software developers and UI, UX uh, specialists who do ML and AI um, in, in Fraser Health. He's got his PhD um, and uh, has a, a ton of experience and uh, really look forward to his presentation um, on uh, and, and great, great wealth, uh, wealth of knowledge. And so look forward to his presentation. So Casper, uh, take it away. Thank you, Jesse. Can you guys see my screen? Not yet. Must be loading. And there we go. OK. Thank you. Uh, so, so, so thank you for that intro. I'm just to re reiterate, my name is Casper. I'm from Fraser Health. Uh, it's an honor to be able to get the chance to share our ML AI, or machine learning and artificial intelligence journey with you folks here at, at Alberta. Uh, I structure my presentation uh, more towards the applications of MLAI, because I think at this point, we probably have read tons of potentials and theories, whether from papers or a lot of news articles uh, out from like Google or many parts of the states. But I, I think what's really exciting, at least for me, really, is to focus on what are the actual applications being embedded in the actual healthcare frontline, and that's what I want to focus on today, our journey at Fraser Health. Uh, if you have any questions I, uh, throughout the talk, I, it would help to, you know, to just feel, feel free to jump in, because I do have different structure throughout, and uh, sometimes if I move on, then the questions may become less and less relevant, so definitely feel free to jump in at any point in time. Uh, so Fraser House, for those who are not quite familiar on the geography, if you look at the, the BC province as a whole, uh, the orange part is where kind of what we cover. Uh, well, there are five other health authorities in BC. Well, we're not like Alberta of one single health authority. We are more uh, uh, geographically divided, six if you in include the uh, Aboriginal health. Uh, we, we cover basically the lower mainland area to the east of uh, Vancouver, uh, specifically uh, starting from Burnaby to the left, uh, all the way to Chilliwack on the right. Uh, so th it is quite a bit of distance and quite a, also quite diverse in terms of the population that we serve. Uh, Burnaby, for example, is much more urbanized, while uh, Chilliwack really is uh, Chilliwack and Mission and, and so forth, and, and also Hope are, are much more rural. Uh, we have over 26,000 employees, uh, 12, serving 12 acute hospitals. Uh, I believe, I saw a report, I'm not quite sure if it's entirely true, but I, I'm going to assume it's true for now, that uh, have, hospitals have the most uh, ER visits per day. As, uh, I saw a report saying we're the busiest uh, ER in Canada, uh, just shy of 2,000 uh, visits in total per day. Uh, we have a fiscal budget of almost four billion dollar. If you kind of translate that to day, it's about ten million dollar that we're spending on a daily basis. Um, you'll hear me kind of referring to financial costs quite often throughout the presentation, uh, and the reason is that because I work for the department called System Optimization together with Bruce, and ultimately we do roll under the CFO. So while other talks may be less focused on the, the dollar. Uh, for, for us, the fiscal accountability and fiscal sustainability is a pretty big piece. And leading from that, I do have a kind of a question I want to just really throw out to you guys. Is our healthcare system sustainable? For BC uh, in Vancouver Sun article, I saw an article saying in 2019, last year, our healthcare spending tops $21 billion a year. And that's about 41% of the total BC provincial budget. 
they have a kind of a dire warning that at a rate at which the spending is growing by 2040, it is projected that that provincial spending budget will, will become from 41% to 55%, which is a pretty substantial growth. And it does seem to give the, intent, the, the image that it doesn't seem very sustainable. And uh, obviously, the talk about creating sustainability in healthcare is not new. Many people have different visions on how to achieve that. For me, I believe uh, MLAI is, should play a big role uh, in creating that sustainability, in part because uh, it allows us to take more data-driven action. We can predict and manage the demand rather than be reactive, always being reactive to the fire, predict instead where the fire is going to happen. And more importantly, we can then assign the resources uh, smarter, su such as staffing, matching to patient demand, for example, so which then will give us more accountability to the way we're spending our budget. The other way, uh, the other reason why we need MLAI is it kind of also allows us to plan longer term strategy. So Einstein defined insanity as doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. Uh, but that's, in my perspective, that's kind of what we have been, at least for health, the, the, my, my experience with healthcare, kind of our, our approach to where we kind of repeat the same thing and hope to get different results. Well, uh, in my opinion, MLAI is the way to break that cycle of insanity, to do something different that will actually make an impact. And ultimately, we want the impact to be linked to the quadruple aims. So better patient outcome, uh, better patient experience, better provider experience, and better uh, fiscal sustainability. Uh, the way we build our ML AI product is really start, start by kind of nurturing the key champions of change. Uh, here at Fraser Health, data science is still relatively new. Uh, obviously, data science is not new in pretty much every other industry, but uh, uh, in, in BC healthcare system, certainly it is still relatively new. And uh, we really try hard to partner with our key champions of change. Generally, these are our medical directors, uh, managers, and sometimes our VPs as well, who are really data driven, and we really try to form close collaboration and partnership with them to kind of get them to do more with the data rather than, for example, just another dashboard reporting some uh, historical data, uh, but really incorporate that advanced data science into our analytical products. Uh, the way we build a AI, ML AI is, is a very standard process. Um, I don't think it's much different than other places where uh, once we have the business problem, then we take our a, a snapshot of the training data, we train different algorithms on that data, see which model produce the most appropriate performance results. Uh, we have a test set to kind of evaluate that data, so it's the evaluate that algorithm, and once the final algorithm is decided, then we kind of deploy that uh, into a frontline BI tool, mostly, uh, for, for us it's mostly uh, Power BI that we're we are using for deployment. And in terms of build, the training, the building and training the algorithm, uh, we're using a combination of Python and R, so we develop all our algorithm uh, in-house uh, using the many packages that are in use by the data science community. Uh, we are more and more shifting towards Python rather than R just because Python is more and more towards kind of the, the go-to for the more cutting edge deep learning approaches. Uh, so the way I view ML AI application is kind of two broad category. There's the patient level application and then the system level application. What I mean by that is it, uh, for a patient level application, I'm defining it as a, an application that uh, informs output at the individual patient level. So the action that we expect the frontline staff to take will impact individual patient, where a system level would be something that the output is not informing per patient, but more about the system overall. And I'll start by giving a few examples of what we have done so far at Fraser Health with, with regards to patient level applications. The first one is our strategy to reduce the uh, hospital costs by improving access and flow. 
So in 2019, at a typical Fraser, large Fraser Health Hospital, uh, we saw over 36,000 admissions, of which 3,200 were readmissions, uh, readmissions within 30 days. We calculate that these readmissions account to more than 22,000 bed days. And through some analysis, we found that if we were able to reduce the readmission rate by even just one-fifth, by even just 20 percent, we can have a cost mitigation of more than $1.1 million per year just by reducing that, the readmission for that one site. So there is a, a pretty low-hanging fruit here for us to go after. And to, to predict, uh, sorry, to, to reduce readmission, our strategy is to use uh, our algorithmic approach for, to predict which patient is at risk to be readmitted. So if we can identify them, then we can flag them for early intervention. We start by using a tool called LACE. This is not MLAI. This, this for, for LACE, it's just a paper-based tool based on very simple scoring mechanism. Uh, it essentially looks at four different variables, length of stay, acuity of admission, comorbidities, emergency visits, uh, and then depending on where each patient lies, there is an overall score that gets created. Uh, this is a tool that came out of University of Stanford and has been widely cited uh, in, in the jur academic journals. But despite its popularity, when we evaluate on our own uh, Fraser Health internal data set, we found only 25% accuracy. You know, it's, it's getting three out of four patients wrong, which is uh, not, not kind of what we we're, were hoping for. So we decided to simply build a better version of LACE, one which is more accurate and also saves clin clinicians time by being more compatible to the existing frontline workflow. I'll give more example, I'll, I'll, I'll do more detail on what I, what I mean by that in the subsequent slide. Uh, first, I'll talk about how we achieve better accuracy, and that's done by the Deep Learning Neural Network. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, I'll keep the technical parts at a high level, so the, the focus is really on the application. Uh, but just a kind of a high level context on our approach to deep learning network, uh, the way we do it is we feed the individual patient data to the, the, to, to, the, to the deep learning network architecture, and the output is basically uh, probability, the probability of readmission within 30 days. Uh, the power of the neural network, it really is it's able to incorporate much more variables than what otherwise a paper-based tool or even a human mind can comprehend. Uh, as a proof of concept, where we started by the variable that were used in LACE tool, so the length of stay, acuity, comorbidity, and so forth. But we also then start layering on additional information, like patient demographics, their age, their sex, where do they live, what are their rough postal code, which we can correlate to various community indicators, like access to community care. Uh, we also can know, have they been homeless in the past? Have they seek shelter before? Uh, do they have history of being abused? And many other kind of social determinants of health. Uh, we can also look at uh, what I call the free text data in, in our system. Uh, namely the historical discharge summaries, as well as uh, registration case notes made during the emergency. So these two fields are not structured. They are free text fields and traditionally have been quite difficult to analyze uh, because uh, of typos, of various acronyms, different people use different ways to describe different things. But with something like deep learning uh, and with sufficient data set, we can uh, start looking into these unstructured data and get uh, patterns that are useful, in this case, for predicting readmission. And the, data, the performance shows that you know, we were able to improve the original lace accuracy of 25% to now 65%. So, and, and this is really due to the additional information that we are bringing in, as well as the, the, the deep learning approach to kind of combine all that information without arbitrary assigning weights, uh, which is what LACE tool was doing. So we're able to kind of really substantially bump up that performance in terms of predicting the readmission. The next strategy then is 
how do we deploy this output to the frontline clinicians in a user-friendly manner? And this is a fake data, uh, what I'm showing in terms of our MVP1 to deploy our output back to the clinician. We deploy that uh, using a kind of a Power BI interface where the target audience is the managers and medical directors where every day they have this dashboard they could look at which tells them out of all the patients admitted in your hospital right now, how many are high risk, how many are moderate risk, how many are low risk uh, based on the algorithm. And then we can also tell them where they are located, are they in medicine unit, uh, and, and also now who, who those patients are. Uh, we also have a linkage to each patient record so that it's not just showing where they are located, but also uh, what, what is the reason why those patients are flagged. So as an example, uh, pa the patient Abbas uh, is flagged as high risk for readmission because he previously has a myocardial infraction. He also has a coronary, chronic pulmonary disease. He has dementia and type 2 diabetes, so a very frail individual. And he also has previous alcohol drug abuse, does not have safe, stable housing, low, low literacy. So these are data that we can present automatically frontline clinicians so that when they're planning what to do in terms of readmission risk, uh, uh, minimizing that readmission risk, they know, okay, um, these are the things that they need to address in their plan. In terms of where to document that plan, uh, we link that to a tool called eye tracker. Again, the data I'm showing here is fake dummy data, although the, the interface uh, is, is what, the, what, what our system looks like. So this is an internal tool that our department uh, uh, has developed. Uh, Bruce, uh, Bruce Davidson is the one leading the, the, the team that uh, is doing a lot of great work to many of our uh, infrastructure development. And eye tracker tool shown on here. So right now is an example of such interface where we're able to allow the care team to collectively document the care plan in one single place. So if some if Abbas from earlier is identified as high risk for readmission, uh, we want a set single place where the care the care plan for Abbas is documented so that all the interdisciplinary care team, whether it's a pharmacist or a, or a social worker or a home health nurse from a community, they could all have one single uh, source of truth to refer that to. I'll pause here for a sec just to see if there's any questions so far before I move on to the next application. Hey, Casper, we have a few questions in the chat window. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, am I able to see that? Sorry, I, I, I didn't, sure. I didn't if you want, I can read them to you. Uh, yeah, actually. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's uh, the first question from uh, Jitin is uh, for Python, does Fraser Health use the libraries online from open source, open sources like GitHub or develop code, uh, everything in-house? Yeah, so it, it's a combination of both. Uh, I'm a big believer in not reinventing the wheel, but tons of academia, much smarter than me, have developed great packages that we could use. So we do try to leverage what already exists on, uh, on GitHub or other open source area. Uh, but if certain things don't exist uh, that's very specific to a particular business context, then we do have to uh, develop our own codes and packages. Uh, some examples include the way we are processing uh, our clinical free text data, which is quite specific to the Fraser House context. You know, the, the jargons we use, the, the certain things that we describe are quite specific to Fraser House. So there are occasions where we do have to develop our own. Although in, in many of those cases, we do try to not still not be from scratch, but more like adaptation of what is already out there. Great, thank you. Um, the next question uh, from Suraj is, uh, is this a mod modified LACE tool or an logarithm um, or your approach published in the journal? Yeah, uh, so th 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 thank you for bringing that up. Uh, 
Publication is a thing on my mind right now. We haven't got a chance to do much of that yet, especially with COVID. Uh, but uh, certainly, uh, I, it is on my, my, my mind to hopefully able to do more, to share some of our, our uh, technical aspects in publication. For the first question, uh, I, I'm calling it NACE version tool. But in reality, though, it's, it is a very completely different algorithm. Like LACE, uh, it's, it's an arbitrary scoring algorithm. Like if you have diabetes, plus one. If you have cancer, plus three. And then the final score is, you know, if you're over 10, you're in high risk. Like it's a very arbitrary uh, scoring method from Stanford, whereas our approach, we're letting the algorithm decide uh, what, um, what weight to give to each variable, and, and also how to combine those, uh, those, those all those weights together in a non-linear non fashion. So the mathematical architecture is completely different. I would say the only similarity is the features. Like we, we do start with the features of LACE, and then we add on a lot more. Great. Um, uh, Ray's got a question here. Have you applied LACE uh, version uh, 2 to COVID patients? Yeah, I, I took a look at it uh, so far. The, it, it's, there's no direct correlation yet. It's really mostly driven based upon whether somebody is old and uh, frail elderly versus uh, more towards a younger population. Because at least for Fraser Health, uh, that's really been kind of the, the biggest driver to the COVID outcome. Like if somebody is, say, in long-term care and they, they unfortunately got COVID, then uh, we do expect pretty... A serious outcome, unfortunately, to come out of it, and we do try to minimize that risk. And what I find is that if it's, say, a frontline care worker who got COVID, uh, for the most part, uh, they have been, uh, the, the, the risk has been very minimal. Uh, and in fact, uh, if I could go a bit on a tangent here, part, part of what we also do is try to predict whether a COVID patient needs to be admitted. And one of the things I'm seeing is that the admission rate uh, really does depend on what population group is getting COVID. If it's a younger population, even in their 50s, uh, chances are they're not going to be admitted, at least for the Fraser Health context. Uh, it is really the patients in their 70s, 80s plus that uh, really have that high risk. And, and in this case, it's not really due to COVID per se, but just they were already kind of high risk for many other things. Um, Brett has a question, what is your EHRs, uh, and are you interfacing with right. them? Yeah, so for our acute system, we're using largely Meditech, uh, so mm -hmm. that, that is our, the main power of, of our EHR. The eye tracker system that I mentioned earlier, I will also treat it as an EHR because it is also a place where clinicians are documenting information. Uh, ideally, we do want it in one single interface. The reason we kind of create eye tracker in addition to Meditech is just because uh, it was very difficult for us to customize many of the things we want in Meditech. Uh, the coordination with the Boston development team down in the States is, uh, has, has many challenges and uh, it, it's much more easier for us to do rapid prototyping by having kind of an in-house EHR to, to to, to roll out many of the things that we want to roll out. That's great. I'll do one more question, and I'm going to hold the rest to the end, uh, just to make sure that we make it through the presentation, which I think is important. Uh, so Jason had a question. How often does the scoring run? Yes, so for the per patient algorithms, whether it's LACE or other things that we have rolling, we do roll it uh, every time a new patient is uh, register into the system. So if we're talking about LACE, then it is predicted the moment the patient got admitted. So the moment in our system uh, we flag a, a new patient has been has popped up in our acute system, then the algorithm will run for just that for only for only those new patients and then present the result. So so I guess the I, I think I forgot to mention this earlier. Uh, the LACE algorithm is run at the beginning of the hospital journey. So the moment they came into the hospital, uh, the algorithm will automatically run it and deliver that information. Great, thanks. Uh, so I'll move on to this example, uh, which is predicting length of stay. 
I'll, I'll go a bit fast on the, on this one because it's at this point it's kind of the same technology, but we're applying it to different examples here. Uh, so the reason we want to predict length of stay, or in this case, basically the estimated discharge date, or EDD, is because past literature have shown uh, when we have an EDD for the patients, they tend to be discharged faster, or and overall have a lower length of stay, and lower length of stay. Uh, will help us have achieve better access and flow in our acute system, and then also tying it back to our the cost conversation. And at Fraser Health, uh, before the EDD field in in the eye tracker is frequently unpopulated. So we do have a place where uh, people can fill out what is the EDD, the estimated discharge date for every patient. But what we found is that it is frequently not used, primarily because the staff don't want to be wrong. When we talk to the physicians, they're very reluctant to give a date because they don't want to be wrong. So our strategy then is, let's have an algorithm that predicts that EDD first, and then we allow the physicians to override that. So at, um, they will feel more comfortable providing their estimate uh, because the algorithm is going to be the first one to kind of make that initial guess. And the, the way that we, we, we want that EDD, that in turn to be used, is to inform daily uh, number of people who can be discharged. So we have a, a separate tool which pulls the EDD data from eye tracker that basically informs for every unit in the hospital how many patients based on their EDD are ready to go, to, to go back to the community today and have we met those targets. And uh, her view of how we predict length of stay is we start by almost 3,000 features from our data set. And then we computationally narrow it down to just slightly over 500. These include uh, many different categories, whether it's uh, length of stay distribution. Historically, for a particular program like medicine or a the unit. Uh, we also look at historical length of stay distribution for the major disease category. So if a patient comes in with diabetes, for example, what is a typical length of stay that that person typically has? We also look at individual patient data, like what is their past acute utilization? What is their past comorbidity? Are they already connected to any community programs like home health? Uh, we also look at other statistics uh, like uh, chief complaints, uh, their age or gender, so similar to the, the predicting readmissions. There's some overlap of features here. And also uh, time of day, day of week. Is there, is there overlap with statutory holidays, seasonality, and so forth? Uh, the key takeaway for me uh, from our lesson is we're able to beat the existing approach by 38%. The existing approach is each nurse will carry a physical printed card uh, that, um, and, and, and they'll keep it with them in their pocket. And what this card contains is the top is, is a list of top uh, what we call the CMG or the you can, treat it, you can sort of see it as the major disease categories like diabetes, congestive heart failure. And the expected length of stay based on kind of a historical average for those things. So uh, that, that was the previous approach. So if, for example, if a patient comes in with diabetes, the nurse will kind of look, at, look up on this card and say, oh, diabetes tend to be seven days. So they will put seven as the expected uh, length of stay. And there are many problems with this approach. Uh, I'm, I'm, I list out the major ones here, including, you know, we, it's, the card space is very limited, so we could only really have 10 different disease classes, whereas uh, there are obviously way more than just 10. Uh, also, the accuracy is pretty low because it is really only looking at average lengths of stay in the past. Like it doesn't look at age, it doesn't look at sex, for example. Uh, it is also very time consuming. Nurses are very busy and to kind of act expect them to carry a card around and looking it up for every patient. Uh, many of them don't want to do that, and I can understand why. Also, it's not reflective of site operations, nor is it adjusting to real-time trends. So, you know, once the card is printed, 
uh, the existing practice was to only update once per year. So it's, there's no seasonality accounted for. Every site is the same car. It doesn't. It's not specific to every site. So with our ETD algorithm, you know, we're able to really overcome all these challenges because uh, it's automated. It's, it's there's no manual input required for that initial estimate. Uh, it uses more features, so it's more accurate. And it's able to learn constantly, so it's adjusting to site-specific real-time trends. So uh, this is kind of another example of our success to having an algorithm that uh, not only has better accuracy, but also uh, saves the clinical front-line front time. And the, the slide here, before I move on to the system level application, is kind of, kind of outlining my vision for our ML AI in terms of predicting at the per patient level. So earlier I talked about predicting length of stay and predicting readmission risk. My vision is kind of to really cover that entire acute spectrum. So from the moment they come into the hospital, you know, we can predict how many people will be coming in, how many will need a bed, uh, aka how many need to be admitted. We can identify early on how many are complex, uh, how many that need specific services. For example, based on the patients who show up at our emergency, uh, can, we can predict how many would likely need medical imaging. So then we can inform the medical imaging department three days, for example, in advance, so then they can start creating capacity and reduce wait time for medical imaging. Uh, these are kind of the visions that uh, we are working towards to, uh, we have different pockets of uh, products deployed in those areas. Uh, I won't go into them for the interest of time, but uh, uh, our, uh, the, the takeaway uh, I want you to have from this side really is kind of uh, uh, the spectrum to kind of what we want to cover, which is from kind of the, the beginning all the way to the end. And for now, this is just the acute. Like eventually, we also want to broaden to the community side as well. Uh, right now, I'm only mainly focusing on the acute, mostly just because community data for us is a bit more challenging to get, uh, especially like the GP offices and all the walk-in clinics. This is a wealth of data that uh, is captured by our, our by our BC government uh, on the island, but unfortunately it's not really uh, readily shared back down to the health authority at the moment. Uh, I will now move on to the system level application. And this is where I mean the applications don't impact individual patient, but more concerning the, the system level. Uh, the first example I want to highlight is kind of the things that we have done for COVID. So uh, probably very similar to some of the Alberta health challenges as well, really is around what are or were the anticipated impact of COVID on the Fraser health system. Some of the things are, I imagine, pretty common, like the, the demand on the acute beds, critical care beds, ventilators. Uh, we have also been asked to do some of the projections on specialized services, like impact on MH, uh, the mental health and substance use, long-term care facilities, uh, palliative care, and also the, the, the supply chain logistics for PPEs. Uh, I'll just quickly show you kind of how we uh, work towards these uh, which for the most part are about uh, uh, displaying it in kind of a, a BI dashboard presentation. So what you see here, for example, is our dashboard in terms of uh, predicting the volume of beds, whether acute, critical care, or ventilators that's needed uh, uh, in, 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 in our Fraser House hospitals. And the, the, the algorithm driving that is uh, is kind of a SEIR approach where uh, we're modeling the spread of COVID kind of across four different states, states from being susceptible to being exposed to being infectious to being recovered. And the reason I kind of highlight this is mostly because uh, our approach is kind of constantly learning the latest trend uh, of COVID for Fraser Health. So the, our pro provincial government also has a modeling group that has done their COVID modeling as well. And the approach is they took what was happening in China and Italy 
and kind of empirically model the same distribution back onto Fraser, back onto BC. And, uh, while there are kind of pros and cons to that approach, uh, the, the major limitation of, that, of their approach really is you're kind of fixed, you're kind of fixed to whatever distribution was faced in China and Italy, and it's not really kind of learning in real time to what's really happening in BC. Whereas for our approach, uh, we're kind of constantly learning what is happening, so then we're tweaking the parameters uh, 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 as needed uh, through MLAI to, so that the patterns we're learning uh, really is uh, adjusting to what's happening in BC. And, and what, right now, we do have an accuracy of around 86%. Uh, in terms of predicting the confirmed cases, uh, whereas for the, the provincial modeling group, their, their accuracy is much lower just, just because uh, of the different approaches. Uh, just a, another example I want to show is uh, we, are, we adapt our modeling to predict the impact on acute psych patients, so showing kind of what the COVID would likely impact uh, for the mental health population. It is interesting that the mental health group, when they first approached us, they were expecting a complete worst case scenario. They thought they were, the entire mental health wards were going to be over flooded with COVID population, and they were not sure how they're going to isolate mental health patients from each other when everyone got COVID. Our modeling actually predict, you know, really only between five to nine patients across the entire Fraser Health sites would have COVID. And, uh, in the end, it was actually only six. So we were actually quite quite spot on with that, and we were able to kind of um, uh, make their fear much more manageable so that they don't kind of go off and plan for extreme worst case scenario that is very unlikely to happen. The other example I will share with you uh, is what I call the money ball. Uh, this is a uh, a, a project idea that I want to give credit to my executive, my ED, Hardy Chagar. He shared this uh, also at a uh, business uh, informatics conference a while back. Uh, the concept is based on a movie that I, I, I imagine probably most of you have seen called Moneyball. Uh, what happened in the movie is you have, it's based on real life, is you have uh, the baseball manager, uh, Billy Beans, played by Brad Pitt, who is faced with extreme physical challenges. He has very limited money, and he couldn't hire uh, the top players that the team wanted. And he decided to think differently. He used a data science approach to select for the players that are predicted to actually perform very well uh, based on stats that other people, based on uh, existing approach would not have considered. And the approach worked out very well. Uh, true story, they, with a team, kind of like an underdog, they won 20 consecu consecutive games, uh, a feat that uh, was, not re was not able to be repeated, at least until, I believe, 20 to 30 years later. So certainly it was a very shocking result, especially uh, with the players that uh, many people thought were not very good players, but the data showed otherwise. And the, we, did, we decided to have a similar concept, money by Fraser House, which is, you know, we have similar constraints in, in healthcare. Uh, how do we create high-performing teams? Uh, when, what are our system-level constraints? Well, we have an aging population. Uh, we have increasing patient volume. More people are showing up at our emergency door year after year. We have increasing medical case complexity, uh, in, uh, which is related to our aging population. We have a limited budget that is not keeping growth with the medical need. And we also have a challenge with retaining many of our talents. Like, for example, out in Chilliwack, very difficult to uh, get staff to work all the way out there as many people prefer to work more closer to Vancouver. So these are kind of many of our constraints that we are uh, 
we, we have to go, go by. We cannot, we cannot go around them. But we can use MLAI with these constraints in mind to identify high performers. In this case, as kind of proof of concept, we're defining high performance as uh, physicians who were able to uh, have an appropriate emergency admission rate. And by appropriate, I mean physicians who were able to know which patient to really admit to the hospital and which patient could be safely discharged back to the community and back instead to a community service like the urgent primary care clinic. Uh, uh, so that, that would be an example of a performance evaluation. Uh, length of stay is another example. Are there physicians who are unnecessarily keeping patients overly long in the hospital? And this is a, I, I say this is an MLAI problem just because if you just compare the average uh, from physician to physician, they will always tell you, well, I'm seeing a different population group than my, than my colleagues. So, you know, there's a reason why my length of stay is, is longer than my colleagues. Or there's a reason why my admission rate is longer because I'm seeing sicker patients. That is the story they will always come back with. So, so with MLAI, our, our approach is kind of a two-step two, two, two approach. First is we perform a multi-dimensional clustering so that only physicians similar to each other based on the patient population that they have seen are clustered together. And then from each cluster, we build a neural network which then allow us to do this comparisons. So essentially, when we are saying, you know, if physician Bob has a higher length of stay than physician Susan, we, we can say, uh, Bob, we, we have already accounted for the patient mixes that you have seen so that uh, your performance evaluation uh, is already adjusted for the, the, the variable factors. Uh, just as a, this is fake data, but basically what we're able to show is, you know, certain number of people, uh, if we're looking at emergency physician evaluation, certain number of people are what we call high admitters, defined as a certain percentage higher than their similar peers. Most are the regular admitters, you know, within the, uh, within similar rate of each other. And then there are kind of the load admitters, which are able to really achieve a low admission rate compared to their peers without uh, introducing complica complications like uh, whether it's mortality or readmission or various other things that you would associate uh, with inappropriate divergence back to the community. And in terms of money, uh, kind of the, the fiscal achievement, uh, we're able to show that if we were at a system level to adopt kind of the money ball approach, there is quite a substantial savings in terms of reducing the avoidable emergency admissions over $6 million uh, on, the, on, the, on the left. And if you look at the bottom right, uh, if we kind of uh, over $4 million in terms of avoiding the length, uh, sorry, reducing the avoiding, uh, reducing the avoidable bad days. Uh, so. Uh, collectively, it kind of optimizes both the inflow, which is the admissions, as well as the outflow, uh, the, the discharges. Uh, there's more than $6 million uh, kind of savings to explore here. And, and for now, I'm really just talking about this. Score, right? uh, we also look at potential impact on what this could mean to many of our access and flow indicators, like ED wait times. Uh, 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 a hospital acquire infection. So uh, there are also many benefits to those uh, indicators as well. Uh, at, at this point, I, I do want to say that this is still an early proof of concept, uh, the, uh, an idea that we are just starting to pitch around. We, are, we have not yet imp it, uh, deployed this model at the moment, but it is something that uh, we are actively working further towards to. Our next step also is to include rest of the care team, in particular the nurses, because uh, while we often say physicians is the most responsible provider, in reality, though, nurses probably play a bigger role in many of the execution of the care plan. So uh, definitely nursing uh, data is, is something else that we want to brought in too that currently we have not yet brought in. Uh, so that kind of concludes my presentation that is here. I, this is kind of our a team picture of our department. Uh, 
uh, as you can see, our department is quite big. Um, not, uh, we have a team about roughly five, which are kind of what we call the data science team. Uh, there's about uh, 12 to 15 of the back end infrastructure team, as others are kind of report developers and many and various consultants that kind of help us build collaborations with the clients. And uh, my email is here at the bottom left corner. Uh, definitely feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or any potential collaborations, then maybe we can partner. I'm always very eager to see what other teams and other health authorities uh, are up to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Casper. Um, I guess we have a couple more minutes. Is it, do, you have a, do you have capacity to take on a couple of questions? Or? Yeah. Great. Um, okay, so yeah, uh, okay, and ended up asking, uh, can you comment on using Power BI rather than uh, Tableau in deploying your model results? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so at Fraser House, we made the decision to go with, top, uh, we go with Power BI uh, mostly because of our licensing costs. Uh, we have Power BI is already part of a licensing agreement across the organization, so it was just an easier choice for us. In terms of which one is better, I I think it's difficult for me to say because both tools are rapidly uh, improving. I think historically Tableau probably was better, but I know Power BI, especially the cloud version, has undergo tremendous pace in their development as well. So I. I, I, wasn't, I won't say that, I, I won't co I comment which one is better, but, but, but in terms of Power BI, my experience so far is that if it's the on-prem on version, which is what we are using now, there are quite a bit of limitations with regards to the ML AI deployment. Uh, although it's not so much a Power BI fault, I think it's more about the way Fraser House infrastructure has set up, where there are many kind of firewall so that if we're trying to, for example, pull any GitHub packages, oftentimes we do face uh, uh, several challenges with that. So it's not so much a Power BI uh, fault, but more of a <laughs> Fraser House internal setup. Uh, but uh, we are trying to get the cloud version, which I believe once we get that, there are many benefits and the deployment should be much more streamlined because then the cloud version of Power BI would be easily connected to many of the Azure packages, uh, like the data breaks and so forth that's already out there, which in turn might actually then be an advantage over Tableau, like, because I don't believe Azure is as integrated with Tableau as compared to Power BI. So uh, if an organization is to move on to, say, Azure, uh, it may make sense then to yeah, to Power BI. Great. And then um, Michael's got a question here. Um, have you met resistance using black box or you know, deep learning approaches uh, that are like, like neural net nets for driving administrative uh, decisions? Um, so by black box, I'm referring to the challenge of uh, deconvoluting the uh, learning process and explaining the predictions in terms that humans can understand. Yes, th thank you. That, that's a very great question. I find that it really depends on the audience. We have a couple of clients who are not data science savvy, but are extremely intelligent and definitely have that passion to be data curious. For those folks, uh, they definitely have many questions around the black box and uh, do want to learn a lot more. I, I would say that it's not so much black box being a, a, a challenge in terms of uh, getting clients to buy in. I think it's more about actually having the time to kind of sit down with them and explain to them what it's doing. Uh, so it's, at least in my experience, certainly when I explain to the clients who are curious to learn, uh, they usually then are fine with the black box approach. Uh, for other people who just want to know the, you know, the, the accuracy, uh, my experience again is black box has quite, ha has worked pretty well. Uh, they, I think their main concern really is has the algorithm been sufficiently validated? So to me, the key always is around uh, what is the accuracy? How are we defining accuracy? How do we measure accuracy? And also, how do we ensure the model will continuously learn to adjust to 
uh, changes in the data set. So whether it's you know, how, how are we retraining the data, how do we make sure when the site rolls out a new quality improvement project, the, the algorithm performance is not going to be substantially impacted by it and so forth. So for me, I, I, my experience has really been kind of having that one communication with the client and communicating all that all that pieces. I, I, I never felt that they want to understand the gritty details of that like neural network, but I think it's more about can I trust the algorithm? And I think as long as we can deliver the performance uh, evaluation and uh, and trust that and, and they can trust that it was done properly, then I I find that usually the buy-in on that piece is is good. Uh, if I could also add, I think that actually the harder buy-in is actually with the frontline nurses because uh, no to disrespect them, but they they are so busy with their day-to-day -day work that sometimes introducing a change, even if it's a change that could help them in their workflow, uh, that's actually the bigger resistance, and which is really becomes more of a cultural change management. So I, I personally find that actually to be the bigger piece. Like the, the VPs, the directors, the managers, they tend to be very on board with introducing new things, especially data science that can help them overcome challenges that have been historically very hard. Like they, I find they're very enthusiastic. It is the frontline nurses who uh, really have to educate and kind of know what's in it for them, right? Yeah. Great. And uh, uh, Aaron's got a question uh, with regard to how do you protect against overfitting? Yes. Uh, so, so for me, pr the protection against overfitting really kind of comes back down to, again, the, the standard training and testing methodology. So similar, I think, to pretty much how you build any uh, machine learning algorithm, uh, you, you, you always want to make sure that you are partitioning your test set correctly, uh, cross-validation on your test training set, and then have a separate test set so that uh, the performance that you're getting on your training set is properly validated against an uh, independent test set. Uh, sometimes it could be a bit challenging if it's a limited data set. Uh, for those, sometimes we do have to perform like sampling first to uh, kind of create a bigger pool of sample size. Uh, I, I think the other challenge could also be the time series problem where uh, uh, the, it's less straightforward with regards to how do we make sure we're not overfitting onto a time series problem. So, 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 so for that one, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, for, for me, it's really kind of about continuous monitoring, uh, just because uh, typically if you're overfitting during your training that uh, as you kind of roll out your algorithm, you probably won't have very good performance moving forward. So uh, we, we do always, whenever roll out an algorithm, we always kind of have a mechanism uh, roll out simultaneously so that in the back end, we are internally monitoring the performance of that algorithm uh, as we roll forward. Great. Uh, Peter's got a question. Um, uh, what paid uh, ML or AI platform or vendors are you using? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for, for us, we really shy away from paying any uh, vendor platform uh, just because there are already many open source packages already out there so that uh, we, it, uh, we can really save a lot of money rather than paying uh, uh, the, the cost to some third-party vendor. Uh, and by, by platform, I'm really talking about, like, like for example, if you're doing in Python, Anaconda is a great uh, IDE interface to to build uh, these ML AI algorithm. If it's R, then R Studio it, uh, is kind of the equivalent of that. Uh, and then, yeah, like I, I haven't been needing to ask really you know, any money from a for my for my boss for for in terms of the deployment on, on a platform I think really the, the the cost so far for us has been investing in the human resource you know like paying the data scientists to come work in the health authority uh, I'm not sure if Alberta health authority has kind of uh, the data science capacity but for us we, we do kind of have to uh, convince the HR to create a data science position because Data scientists really is different than, say, a traditional analyst. They their salary typically is a lot higher. Uh, if we want to be 
competitive to what's out there in the industry. They do come in with a different skill set than what a traditional analyst would be. So for me, I think the financial investment really has been the human resource cost side. Less so on the platform, although I, uh, in the long term, uh, we are trying to move towards cloud, so you could also say that that is a data science uh, platform that well, we will eventually be paying for. Although, for me, when I think about cloud, it's more than just data science. It, it is also about the data warehousing and many other pieces. So the investment in cloud is more than just an M M the MLAI piece. Great. Uh, David's got a question on, uh, uh, he'd be interested in hearing about ethic, ethics uh, considerations for using all the features uh, that you mentioned in your uh, in the readmissions model and the risk of involuntary race, mm -hmm. age, uh, ethic, and discrimination, th mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah, yeah that, that is a very interesting question. And certainly, I'm not sure if the folks on the line are aware, but there was a scandal, I think, a couple of months ago prior to COVID, which uh, there was an algorithm pro popularly used in many U.S. hospitals predicting healthcare needs and you know they were substantially downweighting the needs of the minority races uh, it, it was not an intent because they were training on historical data but that's just kind of what the historical data unfortunately show i so far it, it is a concern for me but so far for what i see in our Fraser health data set is it's actually not showing uh, and probably it's a reflection of our universal healthcare system. You know, like if somebody is of low income, if somebody is homeless, we actually find them to have, for example, higher emergency visits, you know, higher healthcare utilization than other folks. Whereas, I guess if you imagine the same for US, somebody who is homeless probably would show us lower acute usage rate. So I, so far, I've been finding it less of an issue in Canada, at least for the Fraser Health data set, which is probably a kudos to the way you know, we're able to reach out to our minority population. Uh, at least for the, for the data set, I, I don't quite see that as, as a risk so far. Uh, but but it, it's, it's also related to the limited features that we're using. Like, uh, I see the question mentioned about race and ethnic, for example. Those two things actually are not currently being used in our algorithm because it's not captured in our data set. Uh, I think ideally, I probably want to take a look into it, but just right now, the data is not even there. So, uh, so that, 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 that may also explain why the ethics so far hasn't yet been an issue because probably the key controversial data set, we are not really using it so far. That's great. Well, Casper, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you so much for, for presenting to our group. Um, such a great presentation. Thank you. Yeah, and if you know, if anybody wants to reach out, like, uh, I think my email is uh, uh, is in the invite. So, yes, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. So thank, thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much.